But let's get to hour nine. We're going to start in Revelation 19, if you want to open in your Bibles uh, there. And what we're going to start with is what I call the consummation, the wedding banquet. Uh, God uses the terms that are most um, filled with meaning for the people that uh, were receiving this message initially. Remember I told you that poor people, slaves, uh, the common working class people, a banquet to them had two significant implications. One, they didn't have to work. Most people worked from when they got up until night. And most people, there were three classes of people in the ancient world. There were the absolute desperately poor, and they begged. They didn't have a job, they didn't own anything, they didn't even have food for the day, and they begged to get enough to keep alive. That's the very, very poor. Then normal people had enough money for that day's food and everything else, and they went out with food to work all day to earn enough money for tomorrow's food. Basically, the rich, the third class, were the people that had stuff stored up for a few or many days. So that would mean we're all rich. I don't think any of you are begging, you know, in Pottersville or wherever, Scroon Lake, you know, waiting to get something for today. Most of us have something, I mean, when a cup of coffee at Starbucks costs $5 and it's filled with college students, there's no poor person hardly around. See, we have no idea of what the ancient world went through. So when they could go to a banquet, that meant they weren't working all day and they had all their needs supplied. So God calls heaven this invitation, the consummation of the banquet. But for us, uh, I'm going to read starting verse 7. Let us be glad and rejoice and give glory for the marriage of the Lamb has come. His wife has made herself ready. All of us right now are engaged to Jesus Christ. And we are betrothed to him, we are engaged to him, and, and I'll tell you this, my advice, I'm a father of eight children, I have five sons and three daughters, I tell my sons, if you're dating a girl, and that girl is nice to you, but she flirts with every boy that goes by, she probably won't make a good wife. Because girls don't change. And by the way, boys don't either. Make sure you get what you see in the relaxed mode. When they're not under the scrutiny, whatever they act like, when there's nobody like the dean yesterday, uh, Todd came in and told you all, by the way, you did so well, you were all on time, I'm so proud of you. Um, it, and uh, by the way, your work is good too. I got so many emails from 1157 to 1159. <laughs> uh, and it didn't work for a lot of you. You overwhelmed the system. Uh, I got all those notes, too. Uh, a couple dozen of you said, I tried and tried and tried, and uh, can I still get credit? And, and so I forwarded several of your beautifully written appeals to the academic office, and I said, I think Canvas got overwhelmed by all these papers coming in. But I read, I'd say I probably read uh, three or four dozen uh, just quickly as I could. I'm amazed. In fact, I, I sent back comments to a few of you. I said, you know, you are actually, some of you, whatever you are, 18, 19, 20, are gifted communicators. I mean, truly. Uh, it's just amazing to read uh, your insights and some of you, what you're praying for, you know, about, Lord, I don't want, you know, to go back to this or I don't want to succumb to my fears or whatever. It was really a blessing. But Thank you for sending all those in. Thank you for being on time. But for us to think about this consummation and this marriage, we have to think in everyday life. If you're dating someone, you're selective and aggressive. You select the one. By the way, the Lord describes the selector and aggressor as the man. Men are supposed to lead. If a man won't lead you dating, he probably won't lead you in marriage. And if a man doesn't lead you in marriage, your family has confusion from the start. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 11, I'm not teaching 1 Corinthians, but I'll just mention it, that God the Father is over Christ as Christ is over the church. So the Father is the authority over the Son, even though they're co-equal, co-eternal, co-substantial, you're learning that in theology. God the Father, God the Son are absolutely equal, but they have different roles. The role of the son is that he is 
obedient to the Father's will. But they're equal. But he has a role. And the church is to submit to the Son. So it's Father, Son, Church. And in 1 Corinthians 11, Paul says, as the Father is the head of Christ, and Christ is the head of the church, so the husband is to be head of the wife, and they together of the family. But Galatians 3.28 says, men and women are exactly equal. We're co-equals. In fact, I'll tell you the truth, we're not equal. Now that she's gone, I can talk about her. She just left. Bonnie is far more spiritual than I am. She is. Bonnie, I married her because she loved the Lord more than anyone I ever met. And I'll tell you, I met a lot. I met and dated the daughter of every big church pastor. There were 7,200 students at Bob Jones, and many of their dads were big-time Baptist pastors of churches of 500 and 1,000 and 2,500 and everything else. And their daughters sang and played the piano and were unbelievable. But when I got to know them, sat over lunch, and I says, hey, where are you reading in the Word? They go, what? I said, what verse are you memorizing? Is this what you talk about on dates, they'd ask me? I'd say, well, what do you talk about on dates? I I'm trying to get to know whether you're someone I could spend the rest of my life serving God with. I'd like to know what your relationship is like with the Lord. I think a lot of them wouldn't have dated me the second time because that's not what they were interested in. They wanted me to notice how painted up they were or how whatever they were. They were not really into what God was doing through their life. But I met Bonnie, who, by the way, Bonnie not only exceeds me spiritually, she was from New York. She lived here her whole life. She still has awards in New York's system that no one has surpassed. And, and she, when she graduated, she had all those gold, you know, national merit and all this. She had the biggest... You know, at graduation, they put these big things like for being summa and summa summa and magna magna and all that. She had all those when she graduated. When I graduated, they didn't give me a robe. I mean, I just barely made it. But Bonnie chose, even though she's smarter than me, she's more athletic, she used to be on television. She was a gymnast on New York television. They still, so she was 60 pounds and she stood on the hand of her trainer. He'd go like this, and she'd do all those things that gymnasts do, and showed the, the different techniques to do them. All that, and I married her, and even though she's quicker than me, smarter than me, everything else, more spiritual, she chose to let me lead. And by the way, it's easy if you have a smart wife, just say, hey, you just take over and do it. But God won't bless that, and it confuses your children. Do you know why there's a lot of gender dysphoria? That's the proper term these days for Christians. There are Christians that have that. Why? Because their parents say they know and love and follow and serve the Lord, and yet those children do not see a biblical model in their home. They see a man who is abdicated and he'd rather watch television and be in his man cave and talk about hunting and fishing and fixing cars and whatever else the men talk about and let his wife figure out the finances and figure out the family direction and figure out the spiritual welfare of the children. And those children are so confused about who is supposed to be doing what and then they start reading the Bible and they see what it says in 1 Corinthians 11, Ephesians 5 and everywhere else and they go, hey, my parents just say they believe this, they just don't practice it. So, I'm not teaching 1 Corinthians, but I am saying this. God blesses a marriage that follows his word. And it starts with girls finding the most genuine follower of Christ. Don't look for a perfect man, because his mother died before he was born. Okay, there, in other words, there are no perfect men. So don't try and find a perfect one. Find one that God is at work in their life. And see what they're like in the relaxed mode when no one's looking, because that's what they are. And guys, look for a girl that genuinely, not loudly, not boisterous, not, you know, stealing the show, but genuinely follows the Lord. Not perfectly, I'm teasing about the wings. Bonnie, by the way, do you know what Bonnie was when she got saved? She was a bartender. When she got saved, she was 21 years old, an alcoholic bartender 
who was involved in the occult. And God transformed her just like that. See, that's what God's in the business of. Find someone that they don't say, oh yeah, I got saved when I was two. And you don't see any evidence of it today. Look for someone that genuinely is walking with Christ. Now, why? Because we have to get ready for the greatest day of our life. Do you know what the greatest day of our life is? It's the day we stand in front of Jesus Christ. And Martin Luther, the famous reformer 500 years ago, said something I've never forgotten. In his, he had daily table talks. He would sit around the table with all of his, his wife and all of his kids, and then all the other people wanted to come, and he would teach them the Bible. You know what he said once? I have but two days on my calendar. Today and the day I stand before Christ's Bema seat, the judgment seat. That's what motivated Luther to write, to preach, to study, and to lead like he did. He led his family. He led the church. He led scholastically. He led evangelistically. He was one of the more used servants of the Lord in history. What motivated him? I have today to live, and I don't know about anything else, but I do know my next event after today may be the day I stand in front of Jesus Christ. So let's talk about that. What does it mean to stand in front of Jesus Christ? Well, for a moment, turn to 1 Corinthians 3. Now, this is another one of those verses that if you don't have marked in your Bible, I would strongly encourage you because most believers are not fully aware. They haven't, they haven't pondered the implications of what this verse says. I'll start uh, in 1 Corinthians 3.15. Uh, it says, if anyone, well, I better back up. Uh, verse 11, no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Verse 12, if anyone builds on this foundation, in other words, if you're a believer, everything you do is building on the foundation of Christ. But we have building materials, verse 12, gold, silver, precious stones, or wood, hay, and stubble. But no one can tell what building materials you're using because these are invisible. Uh, building materials are our are, are motivations, our inward thoughts, what prompts us, how fully we obey the Lord, how genuine we are in our compassion and in our um, you know, way that we present ourselves, and also whether or not we are humble. By the way, humility is not thinking little of yourself. I was speaking at one of the institutes, and one of the people, one of the students was unusual in this sense. If anybody looked at him, they'd say, don't look at me, don't look at me. Well, if I stood up here going, don't look at me, what would everyone do? Yeah. See, this false humility, like, oh, just don't pay attention to me, just don't look at me, leave me alone, and all that. It's a reverse form of pride. There's two ways you can get everybody's attention. Show off, you know, and be the ham and the hot dog and the, you know, crazy person, or just have this false, you know, kind of cringing. Both draw attention. The Lord knows your motivation. And everything we do in our life is with building materials. It can be gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, and stubble. What's the difference? Well, verse 14, if anyone's work which he has built on endures, he will receive a reward. So now we're talking about rewards. So rewards are only for believers. Building materials are only for believers. And there are choices in building materials. I tell most people, life is like going to Walmart. You, take, you, get a, you, know, you come into Walmart, and one of those retired people wearing a blue vest, you know, Walmart, whatever it says on it, pushes a basket out and says, welcome to Walmart, and pushes your basket out. And you take your basket, and you go anywhere you want in the store, and you put anything you want in the store, and you get to the end, and you go to the checkout counter, and you take whatever's in your basket out and put it on the conveyor belt. Now look at the conveyor belt, verse 15. If anyone's work is burned, he will suffer loss. But he himself shall be saved, yet so as through fire. We had a rental in Massachusetts, and it burned. The renter was smoking in bed and burnt our house down. The renter escaped with their life. They were burned, but everything they owned burned up in that house. They were saved, yet as through fire. There are going to be believers that make it to heaven with their shopping cart of what they did their whole life. That's what's in your shopping cart. All sins are removed because we're justified. But everything else we do that's not sin, like, is it sin to be on Facebook? No. Is it sin to be on 
Snapchat? No. Is it sin to be on YouTube? No. Is it sin to watch football? No. Is it sin to watch, you know, Home Shopping Network or all those Hallmark, you know, romances, movies? And is it sin to play video games? No. But God doesn't reward YouTube time, Snapchat time, Facebook time, video game time. He doesn't reward those things. He doesn't reward watching football games. They're in your cart. They're not sin. What happens to them? Verse 15. They burn up. Uh, I went to Burger King when I was your age, and uh, oh, I was bad. I have so many stories, but I had this gigantic Chevy with a big back seat, and I decided I was going to figure out how many wadded up Burger King wrappers it took to fill the back seat. And so I used to buy the buy one, get one free Whopper. Whoppers used to be this big. Now they're whimpers, but they were Whoppers, you know. And they were huge, and I would get buy one for 59 cents and you got the second one free. So I got two and you made a big wad and I'd throw it over my shoulder and I got my seat all the way up to the armrest full of, I mean, what a dumb thing to do. And I would show off how many Whopper wrappers I had in the back. But I spent a long time at Burger King. They hadn't invented drive throughs yet. Just like cell phones, all things are recent. And so I would go inside and I'd wait in the line and what I would watch every day the person with a little hairnet on would have their gloves on, they'd reach down, they'd get two patties, and they'd put them on this conveyor belt that was kind of like screen, and it would go across, Burger King's monitor was that they were flame broiled. And so there was kind of a fire under there. And whatever they put on the, the conveyor belt, it would go across in front of you. Another person with hairnet on and their little gloves on would have a bun in each hand. And they would go like this, and the little hamburgers would go through the fire, and when they got all done, they'd come to the end of the conveyor belt, and they'd go like this, and they'd go plop, plop. And whatever made it through the fire, the person at the other end received. Everything in your life, in 1 Corinthians 3.15, you're going to dump on the conveyor belt in front of Jesus Christ's throne. Only it's not going to be a Burger King employee at the other end. Jesus Christ is waiting to see how much of your life doesn't burn up. Every day, every moment, you can either redeem the time into gold, silver, and precious stones, or you can just throw a bunch of wood, video game playing. Now, video game playing that's satanic or occultic or gratuitous bloodshed is sin. But just wasting time, as we call or just entertaining ourselves isn't sin, but it burns up. Now, let's talk about the setting. Look in your Bibles at Revelation, and starting in chapter 5, the first thing we see are these countless angels. They're, they're all over the place. And chapter 4 tells us that they're standing all around the throne on this crystal floor that reflects the light. Then you look a little further, and you find those cherubim that are mentioned in chapter 4, and they're surrounding the throne of God, always flying around his throne saying, holy, holy, holy. And then you see the 24, in chapter 4, verse 4, there's the 24 elders sitting on the throne. And when you get to Revelation 1 through 5, you'll find out that the 24 elders are one of two things. Either they're 24 individuals that God picked to sit on the throne. Remember, uh, James and John were arguing about that, and they wanted to sit on one of those thrones. So it could be individuals. Most likely, 24 is used in the Bible for the courses of priests. Peter already tells us we're a kingdom of priests. There were 24 courses of priests, 12 and 12, 12 tribes, 12 apostles. It's probably representative of all the greatest Old and New Testament saints. It doesn't matter, there's just 24 of them, and they represent us, either as priests or as church in Israel or as just 24 that God picked. But they're on those thrones. But then, now here's something. I bet a lot of you have never seen this. Look at Daniel chapter 7. This one is one that got me the most because it finally connected how all this works. In Daniel chapter 7, verse 9, it says this, I watched until thrones were put in place, and then the Ancient of Days was seated on his throne. Now listen to this description. His garment was white as snow, the hair of his head was like pure wool, his throne was fire, the wheels were burning fire, and a fiery stream issued and came forth before him, and thousands of thousands ministered to him. That's millions, by the way. Millions of angels are ministering to him. And 10,000 times 10,000, that's hundreds 
of millions are standing. Now, take your Excel or numbers chart, any program you use that does uh, mathematics, and for a person to have space to fall down on their face and lay down, and then to get back up, and then to fall back down on their face before the throne of God, you need about three feet by six, seven, eight feet. Now put that factor, three by nine would be 27 square feet. What's 27 square feet times hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of millions? Now think about that. If you put, now I lived in Michigan, Michigan you know looks like a mitten, if you put, actually it looks like that mitten going that way, um, but if you put the throne of God with just enough room for the angels to all stand, hundreds of millions of them, and fall on their face, it would fill the entire center of Michigan's peninsula, the lower peninsula. That's just the throne and all the angels standing. We haven't got all the redeemed. And they're all standing very close, like this. This is a huge place that we're talking about. And it says there that in front of the throne, the throne is on fire, by the way, and out of the throne flows a river of fire. Oh, now, go back to 2 Corinthians. And uh, 2 Corinthians 5 has... By the way, the greatest verse in the Bible, most theologians think that 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 21 is the greatest verse in the Bible. Um, I'm not teaching 2 Corinthians, that's second year, but that's about justification. But, but look at verse 9. Don't go to verse 21, even though it is the greatest. Go to verse 9. Make it our aim, whether present or absent, to be well-pleasing to him. Why? Verse 10. Because we must all appear before that judgment seat. Now put all the pieces together. Something that's as big as all of upstate New York, or bigger. Kind of like put a big oval through Pennsylvania. That's just the pavement in front of the throne. Every redeemed person of all time, and all the hundreds of millions and billions of angels are there. And there's a throne. And there's a river of fire coming out before the throne. And Jesus Christ comes out, and it says in verse 10, for we must all appear, Greek word phanerothenai, which means be made manifest. Now what's interesting, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that each one, that's interesting Greek word, heskaton. Do you know what that word means? One by one. Woo. You know, take a picture, you have all the people that go to the back, you have all the people that, you know, like to, you know, go to the front. But at this moment, you can't go to the back. One by one, each of us will be called. To walk up, actually, the throne is raised. That's what Bema means. And we're down at a lower level. And we walk up all alone. And you know what's amazing about God? Everyone we'll see everything. You know, you guys have great acoustics. What a nice screen that is, you know, all these lights. And I even noticed in chapel that there's smoke somewhere coming out. You know, it's just exciting here. That's human engineering. Can you imagine the God who invented radio waves and sound waves and light? What acoustics and what lighting there's going to be? Probably, I don't know, it's probably parabolic or a bowl shape, but somehow everyone sees and we're each going to come one by one in front of the throne Jesus is right there we're right here in front of everybody we dump our life it goes through that river of fire that's flowing out of the throne and Jesus is waiting on the other side to see what we did with our life for him did you know that's the only reason you're here we are here to please God with our lives. And right now, you can coast, you can fake, you can excel. No one really knows. I mean, a lot of people can talk church. A lot of people can parrot. A lot of people can do a lot of stuff. 
But Jesus Christ is keeping track of what's in your cart. And you're going to put it in the fire, 1 Corinthians 3 says. And 2 Corinthians 5, notice what it says. That we may receive, each one, receive the things done in the body. Wow. That's why what Todd Kinzer said yesterday is important. Getting your body into your seat before you're supposed to be there is a conscious choice of whether to be obedient and submissive or proud and rebellious. It really is. You know, people that say, I don't have enough time, we all have the same amount of time. That, that is not true. It's what you do with your time. And if you're self-centered, you do whatever you want to do with your time, and you do not worry about other people. But notice what it says. It's what you do in your body. Whether your body is disciplined, whether your body is reflective of Christ, whether your body is an instrument of righteousness or an instrument of sin, that is what this judgment's about. Do you know what the crowns are? There are five of them. I'm not teaching the epistles, but, you know, there's five crowns. Do you know what one of them is? Do you know what the one that Paul desperately wanted? He said, I discipline my body and bring it into subjection. The word subjection is sub upiazo, which, which means, actually, it's a boxing term, kind of like my dad uh, used to punch my mom, but it's a boxing term, only we box ourselves. And it's hitting yourself under the eye to knock yourself out from things you shouldn't be doing. Now, it's not you know, some kind of a, a self-flagellation or something. It's a choice to say no to sin. When I worked for John MacArthur, we used to go out to eat, and he would get the biggest hot fudge sundae, or we'd be at some restaurant, and they'd know him, and he's famous, and so they'd give him this giant steak. And he always left when he ate a dessert. He would leave this perfect, you know, the cherry, the whipped cream, the pecans, the fudge, the ice cream, and then at the bottom, all that caramel. He'd leave it, and I'd say, didn't your mother tell you there are people starving in India and you need to eat all your food? He said, yes. But he said, I never finish everything to remind my body that it's not in control. See, he didn't live for the appetites of his flesh, and he constantly was disciplining himself. That's what Paul did. That's where John got it from Paul. Paul said, I am disciplining my body. Why? Because we're going to receive from the Lord a reward for what we did with our body, whether what we have done is good or bad. What's the last word of verse 10? Anybody have your Bible open? What's the last word? Yeah, good or evil or good or bad, depending on what version. What does that mean? I thought justification took away all sins. It did. This is not talking about sin. This is talking about good or worthless would be a better translation. In fact, the Greek word is faulon. And that word, faulon, means good for nothing. It's used for steam, a swirl of smoke, a dust swirl, some people's lives are nothing more than a swirl of smoke. There's nothing substantial to it. It's all nothing. And it's good for nothing. And you're only rewarded for what's good, not for what's good for nothing. So that's the greatest day of our life. And by the way, what's the only thing that you can take with you to heaven? People. That's what Paul said in 1 Thessalonians 2.19. He said, what is our hope, what is our joy, what is our crown of rejoicing? Is it not even you at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ? You, saints, that I have been a part of either leading to Christ or nurturing in Christ or encouraging in Christ, you are our joy and our crown. I remember, I've told you, I'm not an evangelist, but I love to share the gospel. I'm always packing in my, my wallet a, a gospel track. But I remember when I was writing... Uh, this course, Living Hope, that book, I went every day to Starbucks, five days a week, for six months. My lunch hour, I sat in Starbucks and edited the manuscript for them, the publishers. And so, for all those months, I was in the same Starbucks, and as I was going in there every day, I would, it was the busiest one in town, number one producer, there were usually 20 people in line, I would always stand there in line, I'd work on my verses and think and pray, and I'd finally get up and order my uh, flat white, and then I'd walk down to the end. And for about two weeks, I noticed that the barista that slid my Starbucks to me would never said a word, but he'd slide it across and he'd look up at me, and his eyes were orange, like Mr. Orange's sweatshirt and Mr. Orange's sweatshirt, uh, who, by the way, is asleep. Don't wake him up, leave him alone. 
he's okay. He's peaceful. He's sleeping. Uh, but do you see the orange? The orange of his eyes. Do you know what that meant, having orange eyes? It meant his liver was failing. He had hyperbilirubinemia. He was dying of overdosing. So I finally noticed his name tag and started praying. I said, Lord, this is the busiest Starbucks in town, but I'm not going to take company time. If you will make no one behind me in line, I'm going to witness to that guy. His name is Daniel. I saw it. By the way, Daniel was in that period. It was called goth. He was in this black stuff. I mean, he had a black M&M kind of ski cap on. He had, he had more piercings than I've ever seen. He had a post to his tongue. I mean, it was as big as my finger and a big BB on the end of it. And he had, his ears were stapled all the way around. You know, I mean, he had, he had enough metal on him, he could never go through an airport. He wore, he wore studs, big metal studs. They were at least an inch long, like little pyramids, all the way down his pants. His shoes had the same studs on him. He wore big metal chains, about an inch and a half that clinked when he walked all the way around his waist. So he's wearing dog chains with studs and with big things on his feet, totally perforated with metal, everything jet black, and he had orange eyes. So I said, Lord, I think this is someone I need to share the gospel with because I could see he was overdosing with some kind of drugs or something. So I put the track in my pocket and I prayed. I walked into Starbucks, 25 people in line. So I went through, and I was, you know, going through, and as I was rounding the corner to the case with the muffins and everything, I noticed there was no one behind me in line. That was an anomaly. And so I kept going, and I got up, and I said, a venti flat white, and I kept going, and I looked behind me, no one in line. First time in six months. So I prayed, 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 and I thought, oh, you only have a few seconds. So Daniel started sliding my flat white across to me, and he looked up with his orange eyes. I said, hi, Daniel. His eyes widened. He didn't know I knew his name. He went, hi. I said, Daniel, there's something I want to tell you. And I was reaching in my pocket. I pulled out the track. I said, Daniel, one day very soon, you're going to wake up in a place you don't want to be. I said, Daniel, you are headed to hell. I said, you're overdosing. I can see that. And I said, I'm giving you a gospel track that tells you how Jesus Christ died to set you free and to forgive you of all your sins. And I pushed it across. You know, he's pushing my... That took 22 seconds. He's pushing, I'm pushing. And by the way, when I got done, they were all filing up. It was the most... I loved seeing that moment. The line. I think they'd all gotten held up. You know, maybe an angel was out there or something. But they all came, filled up again. And I'll never forget as I took my drink and he took that gospel track his eyes were wide I mean they were this big orange you know he just looked at me so I went back to my table I finished editing went home and I couldn't wait I was praying how should I follow up tomorrow you know what could I say and so I came in the next day and I got in line and I went all the way around and he wasn't there so I came in the next day I went there every day and on the third day he wasn't there, I stopped when I ordered, and I said, where's Daniel? And the young lady running the cash register said, where's Daniel? That's what we're all asking. She said, did you know what happened on Monday? She says, on Monday at 2 o'clock, she says, he walked out of the store. He walked right out. She said, he didn't say a word to anybody. He just walked out the store. I thought, I, I thought I'm going to go out back. I bet he died. He's in the dumpster or something, you know, died of an overdose right then. And, and so I just prayed for him. I did actually look out back. He wasn't out there. And I kept coming every day. One year later, I was back in Starbucks doing a final edit, sitting at my little table where I always sat, when all of a sudden, you know how your peripheral vision, you see someone, and I saw black. I could just see black. Then I saw metal. And then I heard chains. And the black spiked boots and the black pants with all the metal and the chains came and stood right at my table. And I looked from boots up. There was Daniel. Daniel had the purest, whitest eyes you've ever seen. He was radiating. And he was still completely, you know, stapled and everything. He didn't have that one anymore, but he had all the other ones, okay? And he looked at me and he said, 
I've been looking at you for the longest time. He said, you scared the hell out of me. <laughs> I, said, I said, tell me about it. He said, you pushed that track. He said, you didn't even explain it to me. He said, I took it and I read it and I couldn't understand it. So he said, I walked right out the back door of Starbucks. He said, I walked down the street of the city and each person I met, I held it up and said, have you ever gotten one of these? Do you understand it? Can you explain this to me? And he said, I kept going till I got downtown. He said, there was a storefront gym. And he said, I looked inside. It was called Guts Church. And he said, everybody was wearing black and were pierced and were working out. And he said, they were kind of just like me. And I walked in and said, you ever gotten this? And he said, yes, that's the gospel and we want to share it with you. Sit down. And they led him to Christ. And he now is a, yeah, praise the Lord. He came to me and he said, I want you to know I got saved. And he said, I'm in a heavy metal, black, whatever, rock band. And he said, and they play and they have the smoke and everything and all that. And he says, and I come out on the stage and I tell him how I was overdosing. My eyes turned orange. I was on the doorstep of hell and someone scared the hell out of me. And he shares the gospel. And he says, I do that now full time. But he said, I want to come and tell you, thank you for sharing the gospel with me. Did you know there's only one thing we can take with us to heaven? People. You have to want to, you have to ask for strength, you have to ask the Lord for appointments, you have to, to ask the Lord to give you just the wisdom of what to say, but that's what the Lord does. Well, we need to continue. Revelation 19, this is the vengeance of Jesus. Uh, it says in Psalm 94 in your notes, vengeance belongs to the Lord. The Lord is going to take vengeance. There is absolute security of trusting Jesus' timing. There are mass murderers, there are mass rapists, there are ma you know, serial killers, there are horrific people that abuse and all kinds of stuff. We are not vigilantes. God takes vengeance. We rest. What does it say in, in John 5, 22 and verse 28? 28 says, marvel not, the hour is coming in which all the graves will hear his voice, all that are in the graves, and will come forth. To what? Judgment. The Lord doesn't forget anything. He's going to take vengeance. He just doesn't do it right now. And Jesus, it says in Romans 12, 19, will right all wrongs. Don't avenge yourselves, Paul said, but neither give place to wrath. Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. The Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of temptation. So we need to trust the Lord. What we see in Revelation 19 is the absolute futility of resisting God. Look what it says in verse 17 of, of Revelation 19. I've got to get back to Revelation 19. And in verse 17, the Lord says, I saw an angel standing in the sun and cried with a loud voice to all the birds and said, Gather together for the supper of the great God. What is that? 60% of all birds migrate over the land bridge between Africa, Asia, and Europe. The greatest bird-watching spot in the world is Israel. And those birds that naturally come through there, the Lord sends an angel to say, hey, birds, don't just fly over, come eat. We're going to kill all the armies of the world. This is Armageddon. And the great supper of God is his vengeance. But Jesus offers intimacy, life eternal, to avoid his vengeance, if you know him. We can rest in his redemption. You know what it says in in Ephesians 1, 7, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sin. I'm the worst sinner I know personally, and I know that every one of my sins are on Jesus Christ. And that God punished Jesus like he committed all my sins, and then he put Jesus Christ's perfect righteousness on me. And God calls me and all those rascals in Corinth saints. And every one of us that know Christ, we're a saint. Well, this is what we call the return of the king. I like it when um, Peter Jackson, you know, named his movie The Return of the King. But this is the real return of the king, and it's this event starting in verse 11. And heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, Revelation 19, 11, and he who sat on it, whose name is faithful and true, and in righteousness he judges and makes war, and his eyes were like a flame of fire. What is this event? It's right there. It's right after this battle of Armageddon, the second coming of Jesus Christ. Now, I wish I could tell you 
what Zechariah says, because it's a climactic moment. The Jews have all been herded into Jerusalem because they trusted the Antichrist, or he forces them in, and they're there, and the Antichrist is coming, closing in. The final Holocaust is almost upon them. He has killed two-thirds of all the Jews on the planet. He's ready to finish off the last third. Finally, Satan's goal of destroying every Jew is almost within grasp. And right then, Zechariah tells us that the Jewish people go like this. And they say, Messiah, Christ, save us. And that instant, through the clouds, white horse, Jesus comes and incinerates all the armies. In fact, well, look what he does. It says in chapter 19, it says the beast, verse 19, the kings of the earth gathered together and the beast, 20, was captured and with him the false prophet who worked signs in his presence. And look at the end of verse 20, these two were cast alive into the lake of fire, burning with fire and brimstone. So the beast and the false prophet alive into the lake of fire. Chapter 20 said they're still alive.